Hi everyone, Whitney Lowe here, and today on our Clinical Insights video, we're going to be taking a look at long thoracic nerve compression. This is something you probably don't hear about a great deal, and I think it's underappreciated, and it happens a lot more often than people are aware of. One of the reasons that we want to look into this possibility of long thoracic nerve compression is because not only might it be a possible cause of pain in the shoulder and neck region, but it also can cause a lot of mechanics issues with the whole shoulder complex, and we'll take a look at how that happens. So first off, let's talk about where is the long thoracic nerve, what does it do, and what happens when it gets compressed. So let's take a look at our anatomy friend over here, and we can see here are some of the main nerves coming out of the brachial plexus and the cervical region, and these of course are the main nerves that go down the upper arm. Eventually too, we've got some other nerves in here that we can put in here, and this one that's colored sort of pink or fuchsia is the long thoracic nerve. Now, look how close it is to the brachial plexus. It really is coming off of those same nerve roots, the C6, C7, C5 nerve roots, as many of the branches of the brachial plexus. So it travels along the same course here. Let's just tip that down a little bit too and we can see. There we can see that nerve running right along those other branches of the brachial plexus. So we can really consider it a part of that same group of nerves that get impaired when the brachial plexus gets compressed by all kinds of factors such as the scaling muscles in there. Let's put a few of those other muscles on there. We can see them and where their relationships are to some of these main nerves that are coming through here. So here's our scaling muscles. And note that long thoracic nerve goes on the posterior side of these scaling muscles so it doesn't get entrapped in between them. But it is also susceptible to compression right around the top side of the shoulder. Now because that nerve goes right across the top of the rib cage here, we often see compression problems of the long thoracic nerve occurring from people wearing heavy backpacks or anything that's got shoulder straps that are coming right over the top of the shoulder and compressing that nerve. Those are the kinds of things that lead to long thoracic nerve compression. Now, what happens when that nerve is getting compressed? Well, let's look at its function here. So the long thoracic nerve, unlike those other main nerves that go down the upper extremity, which carry a large volume of both sensory and motor fibers, the long thoracic nerve is almost exclusively a motor nerve, and it innervates the serratus anterior muscle. Remember that serratus anterior muscle is on the side of the rib cage out of here. We can see that long thoracic nerve extending all the way down here, and it's going to have fibers running into and innervating that serratus anterior. Let's take a look and put it on there for a second. And we see that serratus anterior, and then we can see those branches of the long thoracic nerve that are coming in and innervating that serratus anterior muscle right here. Now, what does that muscle do? So what does that serratus anterior do, and why is it so relevant with the role of the long thoracic nerve? Let's take a look at some of the mechanics of that serratus anterior and what it's doing. We can see why this is so important. Now, here I have highlighted the serratus anterior muscle again. You can see it's coming off the rib cage and then attaching underneath the whole vertebral border of the scapula right here. And one of its most important facets is it's going to pull the scapula onto the thoracic rib cage here. So when there's compression of the long thoracic nerve up here in the shoulder region or anywhere else where it might get impaired, what often happens is an impairment of motor signals. And that means when there's an impairment of motor signals, you generally see weakness and atrophy in the related muscle. So in the serratus anterior muscle, what that weakness shows up as is something that you see frequently with your clients on the massage table, often called a winging scapula. And that is because the serratus anterior is not holding that scapula firmly to the thoracic rib cage, and so it's sort of popping off or sort of bending off the backside of the, of the rib cage. And we call that a winging scapula. So that in and of itself is not necessarily a problem. It does potentially indicate maybe some possible compression of the long thoracic nerve, but there may be other associated mechanical problems that are happening with that long thoracic nerve weakness. Let's take a look at what's happening there. Now, a primary function of that serratus anterior muscle is to help encourage upward rotation of the scapula during shoulder abduction. Let's see what that looks like and see the role that that serratus anterior is playing. Okay, now we're going to watch shoulder mechanics of what's happening during the shoulder abduction movement. So notice here's the serratus anterior muscle, and you've got the other power muscles like the deltoid and supraspinatus, which are performing shoulder abduction. They're the ones that are putting the greatest amount of force on the humerus to generate the power in shoulder abduction. But in order for that arm to come out here to the side, as it does, 
notice that the scapula has to move into upward rotation. If it doesn't, then the humeral head is likely to bump up against the underside of the acromion process. So the scapula tilts upward, and this is a motion called upward rotation. So that scapula tilts upward in upward rotation as the arm goes out into abduction. That way you get a greater degree of space in there. Here is a close-up view of some of those structures around there that might get pinched. If that, that humeral head is moving out into abduction, the supraspinatus or the bursa that's underneath here can all get pinched against the underside of the acromion process right there or this coracoacromial ligament. And the way that your body sort of accommodates that is to tilt that shoulder or the tilt the scapula into upward rotation to make sure that acromion lifts up out of the way during abduction so those tissues don't get pinched right here. Now let's go back to our shoulder abduction motion one more time and notice this, the uh, serratus anterior muscle here. And again, it has to pull that, sh that scapula into upward rotation during the shoulder abduction movement. If it does not do that adequately and it is weak, you might get not only winging of the scapula, but you don't get it lifting out into upward rotation. And that can potentially cause compression of that uh, of uh, numerous structures underneath the coracoacromial arch. So the big question that we want to answer, and the question that comes up all the time is, what can we do about this? What can I do as a massage practitioner to help somebody with long thoracic nerve compression? The challenge with nerve compression problems is that's occurred because something is putting adverse pressure on the nerve. So the number one thing we don't want to do is to put more pressure on that nerve and further aggravate it. So this is an instance where you really want to be careful with the amount of pressure that you apply in this region and don't do anything that further aggravates that nerve. Unfortunately, one of the, the only ways for us to really address this is to just find out what's putting pressure on that nerve and find out anything that we can do to relieve it. So a lot of times, this gets back to the educational things you may be doing with your clients, like asking them, are you wearing any heavy backpacks or equipment bags slung over your shoulder or a heavy handbag or anything that might be compressing that nerve and leading to these problems? Is there anything else that we can do to look for, for something where maybe some other muscle tissues might be potentially compressing that or any other soft tissues compressing that nerve and see if we can do anything to address those? One of the reasons that I always like to keep this in mind about long thoracic nerve compression is a lot of times people with symptoms of shoulder impingement, like, you know, looking like a supraspinatus problem or rotator cuff disorder or bursitis in the shoulder, they don't also look at the mechanics of the shoulder and see this scapular winging in the potential problem that might be happening with the long thoracic nerve, and that treatment will just focus squarely on the tissues in that uh, lateral shoulder region and not look for the nerve compression at all. So this is another important reason to look for a possible involvement with long thoracic nerve compression and we'll try to find some ways that we can to address that and get that person back to full functional activity as good as possible. So if you want to learn some more about this, we've got some other uh, articles and resources on our site and you can also learn a lot more about long thoracic nerve problems, shoulder pathologies, and numerous other things in our orthopedic massage courses over on our site at academyofclinicalmassage.com. So come on over and join us. Learn how to do some things that will really help your clients out.